All right, all right, all right. <clears throat> Let's get fired up here. The Reed Rothbard Podcast. The podcast where we take Rothbardian and anarcho capitalist thought and apply it to popular culture and movies. We analyze these shows and movies for applications of the NAP, the non aggression principle, morality of the actions of each of the characters, and we throw in a little bit of Austrian economics just for fun. Maximum freedom. Read. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Read Rothbard. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Read Rothbard Podcast. My name is Daniel, and with me as always is Robert. How are you doing, Robert? I'm in the house. Literally. Literally. Loving life. I am in the house. I'm not in the cabin right now. I'm in the house. Yeah, I'm in the office. Yeah, because your, your shit's also covered in fleas. Yeah, we had the infestation, man. It uh, started attacking my wife, the, the colony of fleas. She's all torn up from that, like 50-plus bites. And uh, as any husband knows, when your wife gets into a situation where she's both physically harmed and disgusted at the same time, it is in your best interest to go out and try to deal with the situation immediately. So Robert and I went to the, uh, what was it, Petco, Pets R Us, Pet something, Pet Shack. One of those, some, some and, pet thing where they have animals. And through the magic of three market, a plethora of remedies and potions and hocus pocus is available for purchase. So I got three or four different uh, varieties of things, and we are right now bombing the house. So we got to be out of there for the next five or six hours. I find it highly suspicious that your wife was attacked, and yet you suffered no ill at all. I find that incredibly interesting. Coincidence? Perhaps. Or did you sick them on her, and you're an evil flea lord? It's the patriarchy of fleas that are keeping oh. my wife not only barefoot and pregnant, but yep. bit with fleas. That's oppression right there. Oppression, that's right. Well, speaking of oppression and feminism and keeping the the patriarchy strong, we both viewed a movie recently called Changeling, or The Changeling. Is it just Changeling? I think it's just Changeling. Just just Changeling. The 2008 Clint Eastwood. He's east of the wood. He's, uh, he's an old actor, director guy. You've probably heard of him. And uh, starring Angelina Jolie, uh, famously the ex-wife of uh, one Bradley Pitt. Did that already happen? Did that already go down? Porcelain. I don't know. Just, I don't think they're Brangelina anymore. That I, I've never, I haven't heard that in a while. Okay. I heard there was a fight recently. Kid may have been involved. I don't know if a divorce has happened totally yet, but yeah, that woman, the Angelina woman. So yeah, give us a rundown here. I will. I was about to. Um, so the year is like 20s. The place, Los Angeles, a corrupt cesspool of corruption and corruption. Um, mainly focuses on Angelina Jolie and her child and lack thereof, and the LAPD, who kind of run the town like a pack of gangsters, which you would expect, being that they have no competition. The only incentive they have to do anything properly is due to public, public opinion and the election cycle, I suppose in that the mayor might yell at them for being so overtly corrupt. But, okay, so we got Angelina Jolie. She is a plucky young mom, I think divorced for, yeah, because the dad, he just kind of left when she was going to have the baby. He didn't want anything to do with the kid. So she's a single mom, and she works at a, like a switchboard. She rides around on roller skates to get to the different switches, and she's like a manager lady. Anyway, one night, she gets called in and he doesn't get a sitter for her kid. This is like the 1920s. Kids will be fine. Kid's like, hey, I'm fine. I can take care of myself. He's like, all right. She goes to work, and when she comes home, kid's gone. Kid's gone. She immediately calls up the cops. Cops are like, yeah, we can't really do anything. Maybe in 24 hours we'll send somebody out, but usually kids go missing all the time. They come back. And uh, so she waits. And in the meantime, she's out running around the neighborhood asking her neighbors if they've seen the kid. 24 hours go by, kid hasn't come back. And she calls up the cops. Cops send out some people, interview her, and I think they just take the description and go with it. Anyway, she 
time passes and she continually calls the cops for updates on the case and it receives some attention and there gets to be more and more pressure as time goes on to find this kid as she continues on the pressure. Um, at no point does she hire any kind of private detective or anything like that. She's basically just calling and complaining to the cops that they haven't done something for her. And the more the attention the story gets, the more the cops are pressured to solve the case. Um, they end up finding a kid and claiming that it's him, her, her son, in like Iowa, some great distance away. So they put him on a train and they send him over. So she meets them all at the train station and the cops are there for their big photo op. Look at what we did. Look at us awesome cops. We found the kid. And he walks off the train and she's like, well, that's not a kid. And the detective is like, yeah, of course it's a kid. You haven't seen him in like five months. He's going to look a little bit different. He's been through a lot. But, you know, this is your kid. And she's like, no, I'm not retarded. I, I, I know I'm, I'm the kid's mom. I've, I've, I've raised him since he was a nothing to, uh, what is it, like an eight or nine or ten-year-old kid. I know what my own kid looks like. You're being incredibly insulting. But they kind of say, well, even if this isn't your kid, take him for the night. See how you feel about it. Maybe you'll realize that this is your child. But she takes him home reluctantly. She gets photographed with him. So the, the cops get their big advertisement. Hey, we found this latest kid. This is a big win for us. Look how good we are. We're good cops. Meanwhile, this woman is taking care of this kid at home. She goes home. She t- gives him a bath. And she's like, this kid is circumcised. My kid was not circumcised. This is a totally different kid in addition to the fact that I know it's not my kid. And then she, she measures him for height. And this kid is six inches shorter than her other kid. So she goes and she calls up the, the cop and she's telling him, presenting all this very, very convincing evidence and they dismiss it out of hand. And they assume that she's like hysterical and crazy and that uh, she was enjoying her freedom by not having a kid. And now that she's got the kid back, uh, now she's got to take care of the kid and oh, she doesn't get to sit around and have fun all the time. So she's just making up excuses to not have the kid anymore. Like the kid is some big burden. And she's saying, no, look at this information. This is clear data. This is not my kid. In addition, that I would be the expert to decide whether or not I recognize my own kid or not. So the cops, and I'm jumping around a little bit, um, but the cops eventually call in a doctor who interviews her and explains away these discrepancies and says that, oh, yeah, maybe the, the kid was found with this drifter guy. Maybe he, he probably circumcised this kid. Is that the thing drifters do? They're always going to the hospital, circumcising kids, but they do. They spend their luxurious amounts of money that they always have on circumcision. They're so necessary. And the doctor describes the kid losing six inches in height as, well, he was quite malnourished. You know, kids, kids shrink. That's what they do. That's what they do when they're, they're malnourished. Kids shrink six, six, six inches in five months. That's the thing. You're just a crazy woman. So um, there's also this uh, pastor guy who is like the head of some local church who is running a crusade against the the LAPD for their corruption and murder and violence. And he kind of becomes Angelina Jolie's ally, uh, trying to help her in her case for justice. Um, Let's see, what else happens? Let's see. uh, So she eventually goes to the police station and gets, kind of confronts the detective finally because she had taken the kid to uh, the school and the school teacher was like, yeah, that's not your kid. Took the kid to the dentist and then is like, yeah, I've, this is not your kid. So she's got all this good evidence, the shortness, the circumcision, the testimony of the teacher, the testimony of the doctor goes to the police station, confronts the detective. This isn't my kid. And the guy's like, Hey, you need to admit that it's your kid or else you're crazy. And she's like, it's not my kid. And so they kidnap her and take her to a mental institution where upon sanity is defined as admitting that it's not, that it's your kid and that the police didn't do anything wrong and that you're not going to sue them and all this and that. But you're insane if you still insist that it's not your kid. And she meets some allies in the place, all these women that had been kidnapped and put in this mental institution, basically for just being a problem that cops had to deal with. Like, there's a prostitute that one cop would like to beat up all the time, so she makes a complaint about him. Well, she gets put in the institution. Anybody who's inconvenient, 
and they're all women. So I could see why this is a fairly feminist kind of movie, I suppose. But I saw it more of as a bullying type thing because these cops were just basically bullies. They did it because they could. Um, and they had support from up high for the most part, the police detective or the uh, commissioner. Although he's not a big character in the movie, but he, I think he, he is a part of it. Um, eventually the pastor guy, he gets enlists the aid of like the defense attorney in the area, like the superstar, like get off OJ style defense attorney. And he works the case pro bono and they end up, uh, see why, why did they originally get her out of the prison? Do you remember that Daniel, how they originally get her out of the, 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 the psych ward? Yeah, the lawyer gets a subpoena or gets a court order and basically demands her release. Once they discover that she was in there and falsely imprisoned, because that's what it is, it's an imprisonment, no right. no uh, trial, no due process or anything like that. And uh, No, they, they, were, they that, never charged her with any crime. Yeah, they said it was for her own safety or whatever. But she was imprisoned in this psych ward, and like you were saying, she was uh, basically told that if she didn't accept that that not not her kid was her kid, then she was crazy. And sort of reminds me of um, the language that the psychiatrist or the psychologist used against her. No matter what she did, she was going to be seen as crazy. Like if she um, was hysterical about or, or insistent that it wasn't her kid, then she's delusional. But if she was um, accepting of the kid, then she was crazy because it's not her kid. And if she was just... Uh, disaffected, like unemotional, then she had flat affect and had some other problems. Like, no matter what she did, they could claim that she's crazy, right? And right. it reminds me of uh, a joke that Walter Block t tells in, in some of his lectures about antitrust legislation. So there's these three guys in jail for antitrust violations, and the first guy says, yeah, I'm in here because uh, I charge too much. I was a price gouger. You know, I charge more than my competitors, so they got me for price gouging. Next guy says, well, I'm in here for underpricing. I was doing a vicious uh, price cutting and, and trying to steal away customers uh, and shut down you know, my competitors. So I'm in here for having too low price. And the third guy says, oh, shit, I'm in here. I charge the same exactly as everyone else. And they got me on collusion for price fixing. <laughs> so, you know, he submits to you that, uh, well, you got to do one of the three things, right? You got to either charge the same more or less, and either way, you're screwed. So that that's, was kind of fun. That reminded me of... Uh, of that situation with uh, antitrust legislation. Right. So um, so back to the story. Um, subplot, well, kind of like, I'm still telling the story, but um, we learned that there's this serial killer who enlists the aid of a child to go around and kidnap children, take them to this farm, and then murder them. And the question throughout the movie is, was Angelina Jolie's kid one of these kids that got kidnapped and murdered? And throughout the entire movie, we assume that he was, but we're not 100% sure because some, at least one child did escape. But I think it's more interesting to talk about because the kid is originally like some kid from Canada, the kid that's helping the serial killer. And okay. uh, like a deportation uh, one of the detectives in the LAPD is going out to grab him to send him back to Canada. But when he does this, the kid confesses to all these murders and saying that he was threatened the entire time to help do this. And if, it wasn't, if he wasn't going to do it, he would get some other kid to do it, and he would just murder him. So he was under threat of murder this whole time to help this serial killer commit these murders. And there's the whole subplot of going out to the farm, digging up the bodies, interviewing people, looking at photographs. And he identifies Angelina Jolie's child as at least one of the kids that they grabbed up off the street. Yeah, and at that time when he identifies him, he identifies him as one of the kids that was murdered. But yeah, uh, later on it's revealed when. Well, honey, this is a microphone, and I'm doing a show right now. You're on the show. You want to say hi to our listeners? They're fans of Murray Rothbard if they listen to us. Do you like Murray Rothbard? Yeah. Yeah, you do. I forgot where I was there. Oh, yeah, so the kid that uh, ends up escaping and then revealing himself several years later, and he waited a long time because he was embarrassed and thought that uh, 
he would get in trouble if he um, said that he had escaped or said that he was one of the kids that was taken to this ranch where the murders happened. Uh, he said right. that Jolie's kid was the one that came back to um, unsnag him from a fence or something like that, and if he hadn't have done that, then he would have got caught uh, when the crazy dude came out and, and heard the ruckus of them escaping. And then the three of the kids that escaped, um, Walter was Julie's kid, this uh, other kid who came forward, and then this third kid all ran in different directions. And that's the last known whereabouts of her son, uh, as far as the movie goes. So he just knows that they all three ran off, but he doesn't know if that kid got caught again or not. Right. And if we haven't mentioned this, this is supposedly based on a true story. And isn't there some anecdote you know about this, Daniel, you're telling me about? Yeah, so this whole situation came to light because uh, the records for the events were set to be destroyed because they were so old, you know, 75 years or whatever the government regulation is surrounding such records. And the guy who was in charge of destroying the records, um, burning them or shredding them or whatever they do, uh, read through some of them and was like, you know, this would be a good screenplay. I'm going to call one of my buddies who's a screenwriter and have him come check these out. And things proceed on, and uh, there's over 6,000 pages of documentation regarding both the treatment of Julie's character and the Wineville ranch murders that uh, were part of the investigation or part of the story. And it became such a big deal, and so the name Wineville murders became such a, a, a known thing because of all the press coverage at the time that the town changed its name and is now today known as Mira Loma, California. So we have government to thank for this new story. If it wasn't for government about to destroy these articles, we wouldn't have gotten this movie. Yeah, I mean, Yay, I'm sure, government. I'm sure the newspapers at the time would still be available in some archive somewhere, but it right. would have driven people to review it uh, unless they were destroying the official documents. Right. So let's get into um, any kind of moral qualms you have with the movie. I mean, I mostly saw this as a big act of bullying. Um, yes, it was mostly done to women, but the men actually, I mean, the cops were running all kinds of rackets and they actually didn't, they wanted to wipe out their competition in the, the different criminal activities they were undergoing. So they would just kill the men. And then if there was any women that were inconvenient, they were just declared insane, mentally unfit and thrown into prison. Um, I think that even though murder is generally the worst thing you can do, almost Calling someone crazy for being sane and then imprisoning them is almost worse. It's, it's definitely less honest. Yeah, and then it's a more sustained uh, period of terror or um, torture. You know, if you're just shot and murdered, it's kind of over and done with. But if, if your kid has been kidnapped and then there's this incompetence within the police department or you know, they're trying to save face, because they were having a whole bunch of bad press at the time. Uh, crime was out of control, so then this new captain was hired and he created the gun squads, which were just basically go out and just murder people, just straight up murder. Like, even if you're thought to have committed a crime. I mean, this is like Stalin, Mao, Cambodian shit that was going on in Los Angeles, uh, yeah. which is ridiculous. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and of course we know about it now because of because the, the records were about to be destroyed. But basically they took a hard stance against any criminal activity and just straight up murdered people. And so to treat the women how they did was, of course, horrific. Um, but was in a way, at least they weren't murdering them straight up. Right, and the end result of all this, there's a trial with the Johnny Cochran type lawyer guy where he puts basically the police department on trial where the main detective is recommended by the jury at the end of it to be fired. And as I recall, also the police commissioner, but the jury didn't necessarily have the power to just get rid of him at the time. Is that right? Yeah, and, and actually in the... Uh true story, you know, the actual events, um, they recommended those things, but then both those guys came back. Uh, the mayor did not seek re-election, though, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, um, the the main detective who gets, you know, who, who threw her in the psych ward and, and basically mishandled the case and then wasn't willing to admit his mistakes, and so he just kept piling on the uh, cover-up attempts and, and terrible shit, uh, was played by Jeffrey Donovan, who also happens to be the, the guy, Michael Weston, in the great libertarian-ish show, Burn Notice, also starring one Bruce Campbell. Burn Notice is a libertarian-type show? I've never heard of that before. Yeah, he goes rogue, right? He gets the Burn Notice, he goes rogue, and he starts helping people in a voluntary fashion. And like like the A-Team? Uh, yeah, it's A-Team-ish, but for, I don't know, like USA Network or 
one of those like lesser networks. <laughs> so yeah. It's kind of a fun, uh, a fun mindless show to watch. Uh, my wife and I watched the whole thing, and it was kind of fun. And Bruce Campbell's great. Yeah, Bruce Campbell's just dead. I'm a big fan. What, what did he play? Not to get off too, uh, too off track, but what was he? Uh, is it a rogue what? So Michael Wesson was a CIA agent, and then he gets outed uh, during a mission by the CIA, and he's supposed to be murdered as a result of it, but he escapes and then tries to find out why he was uh, burn noticed, and it becomes, you know, five seasons long. But each episode, they find some, you know, somebody who's uh, having some problem due to government or gangs or what have you, and uh, it's, you know, the first 45 minutes are like, how are they going to get out of this? And the last three minutes are they magically solve it. But, you know, it's a formula that they employed, and it was great. It was a fun show. Sure. All right. Okay. But Bruce Campbell's like his, uh, his buddy. He's an ex-Navy SEAL. And uh, he, oh, okay. he helps him out with his missions. And then there's some, uh, some super model type uh, girl who helps as well. you got to have some sizzle on that steak. Okay. Back to Changeling. I just want to say this is a kind of movie that really pushes my white knight button. Uh, anytime you see, like, just a big bully preying on a weaker person, it really fires up my juices to want to go and defend that person. Um, and maybe that just reinforces my libertarian beliefs that there are plenty of people out there that would rush to the aid of someone being attacked. Yeah, um, like the, the John Malkovich character, the reverend, who has the radio show and helps her out and then, of course, em- employs this lawyer to help her. Right, and that's all done voluntarily. Yeah. You know, I find it uh, interesting that it, within the story that they'll straight up murder uh, people who they think might have committed a criminal act, and they'll imprison this woman who they're, you know, bungling her case, covering up things, and she's causing some waves in the media, so they try to get her out of the way. Uh, but this um, reverend dude with the show, who's basically denouncing them day day in and day out, sort of like we do on this show, uh, they don't just straight up murder him or discredit him in any way. Like they didn't cover all their bases. If, if they're going to be bad and evil people, go all the way, right? Like like for us. When we apply the NAP, we go all the way, maximum freedom. Yeah, you want to go all the way, although I can see how the pastor guy, I mean, he had a radio show, he had a public forum. It would have been more difficult to discredit him. Well, maybe it probably would have been a little bit more difficult to discredit him. Um, he has a certain thing called, like, media cover, where you can't just make someone with a really high profile disappear without questions being asked, like inconvenient questions being asked. Well, I so guess, I can uh, see how he would have been a little bit more difficult target. Uh, yeah, Hillary Clinton wasn't around then. So the wet works that uh, surrounds her wasn't right. yet in employ, possibly. Yeah. Yeah, so what else about this film? Uh, there are some themes. A lot of people see some uh, feminist-type themes, like how she's considered a little lady and no one listens to her. Like, she makes that claim many times, like, you're not listening to me. Do you think that that is a function of the times, or do you think that that is um, perpetuated by film, and so, you know, this film came out in 2008. Do you think that that kind of thing being um, in a film, in, in popular culture, then has an effect in society, and so some of the SJW warrior feminist stuff we see today may have had some level of uh, influence from a film such as this, or films in general. Do you think that popular culture is a leading edge of creating a, um, a stream of thought or a movement or some something that then becomes uh, within the society uh, a few, not generations, but, you know, some time later? A lot of questions in that statement. Um, Does it make sense what I'm, what I'm sort of saying, though? Does it make sense what I'm uh, meeting I don't know. I thought, I, I thought you were making sense there for a second, so I was going to say something, but then you just kept talking. Um, yeah, went off the rails. <laughs> um, I think, okay, so first, do, do, you, do I think that people used to just not – listen to women. I'm not so sure that women are listened to any more or less now than in the 1920s. It's possible. Um, There were probably less women in the media back then. Um, I think there are definitely more women, you know, posting on blogs. I mean, media is cheaper and open and more free than it ever has been. Um, uh, Did people discount things people said just because they were a woman? I mean, people do that now. People do that now with anybody. Um, I get discounted for what I say because I'm an old white man. Um, You're fucking old. On... You're an old white man. You're <laughs> fucking old. 
but that's based on someone's personal preference about whether they're going to listen to someone or not. You know, if you, if I come walking up to somebody and they don't want to listen to me because I'm an old white man, that's their choice. They're perfectly free to do that. Was it more prevalent back then? It's hard to say. I wasn't alive back then. Um, but I, I know if you're a feminist, you tend to look at those kind of things through kind of feminist colored glasses and say that, that you know, the patriarchy was alive and strong back then. And just as strong as it is now, I guess, um, just manifesting itself in different ways because you can't really complain about not having as much of a voice now because everybody listens to feminists apparently these days. You know, they influence government policy, and you, you hear them all the time. You see them in the media, like you're saying, with uh, feminist films. And you, if you look at this movie as a feminist movie, um, you can definitely see, I, I think I can see some kind of a feminist angle on it, and it would be more likely to be made because there is this kind of feminism culture a little bit. I hate to use these kind of words sometimes, but it's the best words to describe them. Um, I'm not really sure if I'm even making a whole lot of sense, but that's the fun of these things. Um, I just saw it as a, as a powerful person willing to use violence like these cops, um, abusing and bullying people that they could bully. That's how I saw the movie. Um, they maybe saw her as a threat because they were embarrassed by this case that they couldn't solve. So then they, as cops are, they're not averse to using violence, so they're just going to use it. Um, they're not afraid to commit crimes as well as try and solve them. Um, so it's not necessarily surprising. They did take advantage of the sanitarium um, the sanitariums that like existed back then. So I don't know if we really even have those kind of psychiatric hospitals like they did back then where you could just commit somebody. They may still exist, but they're not necessarily in the numbers or the prevalence that they did back then where you could just commit somebody and sign off that, yeah, she's crazy. And then she'd just be gone or he, um, I think it's a little more difficult to do that now. I could be wrong. Do you know anything about this? I'm totally talking to my ass right now. Yeah, it does seem to be that those types of things, uh, might have been more prevalent historically. Uh, I don't know, and I'm trying to recall from my psychology degree, if it's a function of there just wasn't enough government funding after a certain period of time, so they stopped doing that kind of a thing. And of course now a whole bunch of lefties cry about how there's not enough funding for mental health situations, and so that's what leads to a lot of homelessness and street crime and things like that. Right, so we used to just throw them into these sanitariums, and now they're just left to live on the street. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I did see a quote from the police chief back uh, at the time of LAPD, back in 1928, when this happened. He says, quote, We will hold trial on gunmen in the streets of Los Angeles. I want them brought in dead, not alive. And I will reprimand any officer who shows the least bit of mercy to a criminal. So does that apply to themselves? Of course not. Of course not. But, you know, that's what you get when you have a uh, state monopoly on violence. Yeah, it's really hard to look at that kind of thing and look at the system that creates and allows that kind of thing and then to just say, well, this is just one bad apple. This is just, you know, a few bad apples. It's really a function of not having an incentive to really serve the community and or at least your customers and not having competition. It's what well, you expect, I think. And then speaking of competition, um, it turns out that, at least in the premise of the film, and potentially in the reality, that these gun squads weren't necessarily only going after criminals, per se, but also people who are competing with the police in the uh, gambling and prostitution and other nefarious activities, or quote-unquote nefarious activities, uh, so as a way to basically become the gang themselves. Right. So they did actually operate as a mafia gang, where they would go out and eliminate competition in the rackets, the prostitution and the gambling, and at the same time also trying to hold this law enforcing face to the public. But yeah, you give you give guns to a people, and you say that you're you're lawfully allowed to use them against peaceful people, and this is what you get. This is one instance of corruption, but there are these, these things happen all over the place. This is not a one-time incident, not something that just happened in the 20s. This is a recurring theme throughout history and throughout the world. When you Isn't have that, the monopoly use of violence. Isn't that a current complaint with, the, complaint with the Black Lives Matter that essentially the police can go out and shoot anybody and not have any co real consequences to their actions? Uh, of course, they, they make it a race thing, um, but I think uh, a lot of people debunk, debunk that, like Shapiro and Milo Yiannopoulos, where they show that actually more white men are killed by police than black men. 
But there is a kernel of truth to what they're saying, that the police shouldn't just have the ability to go out and, without any real consequence, you know, paid vacation is not a consequence, sorry. <laughs> uh, they can just, you know, basically do whatever they want. Special rules, because they, they wear a costume. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's a, necessarily a race thing with the Black Lives Matter people, and I have a lot of my issues, a lot of issues with those, those groups, especially when they start rioting and attacking and whatever and make it a complete race thing as if all white cops are racist or whatever, which is clearly demonstrably false. But I, when, you, when you give a group of people the right to initiate force against another group or anybody else, and then there's absolutely zero consequences to their actions, they don't lose market share, they don't lose customers, they get paid vacation, or maybe they lose their job. Maybe. Oh, no, they just go get another job. I mean, the, the, the most severe thing that the public can do, really, is kind of name and out these cops. Um, and then the cops will come back and say, yeah, but we were trained to do this. We're trained to dominate a situation, to kill, to shoot. Um, is that really any well, kind Larkin of Rose, Yeah, Larkin Rose puts it that they're trained to escalate a situation until they achieve control of it and dominance. That's not just him saying it. That's what cops say themselves. That is absolutely how they are trained. They believe that they must control a situation. That's the only way that the situation, he can do his job, that the cop can do their jobs, is that they dominate and control the situation. They have to be the authority in the situation. So what you're saying is, is that you have, your job entails the initiation of force and violence against other people. people. Well, maybe your job isn't an ethical job to have. And not only the initiation, but the escalation thereof. Right. And you're not subject to any kind of market forces. So anytime you do step over the line and you start just murdering people that are clearly at your mercy or not a threat to anybody, there's like a, an investigation, quote unquote, and maybe you're put on administrative leave. And then as soon as the story dies down again, you're back on the job. And the investigation is the police investigating the police. It's sort of like when there's a uh, constitutional uh, question with, a law or some kind of court case, um, it's always the government deciding whether the government did something the government should or should not have been able to do. Right. You know, that's no balance of powers. That's all one entity that has decided to give it different segments of itself different names. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not like in the market where if there's a product that nobody wants, nobody buys it. But here we have a product regardless of whether we want it or not. The only way these things are going to stop, or slow at least, these events where cops are killing people, is to repeal laws that put cops and people together. There's no, if the cop didn't have a reason to go after that person, to stop that person, to talk to that person, because the law didn't exist of what they were doing, then these situations would not escalate. They wouldn't exist to begin with. Yeah, there's a great uh, Robert Higgs quote, and I don't have it in front of me, but I will try to find it and post it below. So, folks, if you're watching or listening... Um, go to readrothbard.com, episode-32, which I think this one is, and look at the quote I'm going to post below because uh, it's super good, and I think it refers to how there are no good cops because they're all sworn to uphold illegitimate laws and uh, escalate situations, et cetera, et cetera. Super good stuff. Robert Higgs is great. Right, and the list of things that they have to interact with other people with continually grows as government creates more and more laws. So these things are only going to increase. As, as more and more busybodies want laws to prevent people from doing X, Y, or Z, things that are perfectly legal to do today will now be illegal tomorrow, and it's another excuse for Johnny Law to come walk, knocking on your door or to pull you over or to stop you on the street and to demand something from you, demand some behavior from you, demand that you present some sort of identification to stop and to obey his commands. It's one human being telling another human being that they must do a thing because if you don't, I will murder you, or at least I will stop you. I will, <laughs> I mean, have a cop, you know, just look at you and then just start running and see what happens. Just start running or just like, even just start jogging slightly in the opposite direction. And instantly that cop will chase you down, tackle you, even though you've done nothing wrong. Yeah, There's no suspicion of you having done anything wrong. But a cop will think you might have done something wrong just because you happen to have seen him and started going the other way. It reminds me of that meme that my wife sent me and I showed you when we saw each other recently. This cop pulling someone over and says, I see you failed to use your turn signal back there. So I pulled an illegal U-turn, broke the speed limit, forced other drivers off the road with my flashing strobe lights so I could detain you and extort money from you to teach you a lesson 
about unsafe driving. That is exactly what happens all the time. It's happening right now as we record this message. It will continually happen. And if you don't see anything wrong in that, then I don't, I don't know what to say to you. Perhaps you're a psychopath. <laughs> Probably. I got something wrong with me. I don't know. Um, but we're getting a little bit off track on the Changeling episode, although we might have exhausted it. What do you think? Is there, do you have anything else? Do we have any guests that could come on and talk about this, or what, what's going on? My wife was interested in uh, making some discussion points on this, but between uh, her and I having the two kids, I've got one, she's got the other, it's not going to be able to happen where uh, she'll get on the show with us. But I think we have covered most of what we wanted to say between you and I. Um, I did want to mention that it is an Eastwood film, and he's kind of known for sort of this understated directing style. And it really comes through, like, in this film, it's, um, it's, it's a very relaxed pacing, very stark, like, there's piano music that uh, actually Eastwood himself composed, and I don't know if he performed it, but he composed it. And it's, it's oh. kind of a study in sort of minimalism in a way. Uh, he's, like I said, known for his very understated directing, very efficient, uh, not very costly. Uh, and sometimes I wonder if, uh, you know, he did that uh, speech about Obama talking to the empty chair? Yeah. Uh, I wonder if Eastwood is basically the empty chair during the directing. I don't know. It's kind of the, the thought that came into my head. You know, like he doesn't really have to do much. He just says, all right, action. All right, do it. <laughs> all right, done. Could be. I, I, yeah, I really don't know. I haven't heard any stories about what he's like to work with. Um, he is getting on in years. It's amazing the, the amount of work he still continues to do. I mean, he's almost like 90 or something like that. Yeah, he's 86, just uh, like our Thomas Sowell, who just recently retired from doing a syndicated column, so the same age. And uh, what's interesting is I look at the Wikipedia of Clint Eastwood, and it's, of course, very long, uh, but it says he's been a libertarian since uh, 2009, present. What? Yeah, it also says 1997 after 1999, so he's sort of dabbled in being a libertarian. Prior to that, they listed him as independent, and before that, Republican. Maybe Ron Paul had some effect on? Yeah, perhaps, yeah. Uh, there's a story in The Guardian that's the reference for this um, where he talks about aging and politics and apparently says that he's a libertarian. So there's another one to chalk up for the libertarian side. I don't know if he's like a legitimate, you know, strictly NAP, and that's the issue that determines whether yeah. you're a libertarian in reality. I think they call it thick or thin libertarianism. Yes, right. Uh, and it, I don't know, is it, is it thick libertarianism or thin to say the only qualification is do you believe and uh, support the NAP? Like, that's the deciding factor. Because that's kind of what I I, where I sit. I could be wrong. I'm not going to answer. I'm not going to display my ignorance by answering, but I think it's thick, but I could be wrong. It could be the other way around. I don't know. I thick makes it sound like you're, you're letting more people in, you know, like through association. Like, well, they believe in this sort of libertarian-ish idea. Like, Gary Johnson mm -hmm. might be considered a libertarian mm -hmm. as a thick libertarian. Uh, I don't Could consider be. him a libertarian in any way at all. Uh, he's one of those guys who's like, well, we're socially promiscuous, but fiscally conservative, so we're a blend between the two other parties. Yeah, he's, he's a politician, so his, his views follow opinion polls. Uh, I bet to me it's in no way, in any way, any kind of libertarian. I think even, even the most libertarian-ish party-type libertarians at least have something they believe in, in that, say, what's a good government, well, a smaller government, what's a better government, a smaller government than that, and on and on and on. Yeah. Um, so at least I think even they believe in something, even though minarchism makes no sense. As I said before, and I will continue to say, because as we talked about in the mall, uh, liber minarchism is a state in which there's, where 99.999% of the populace is unhappy at all times. All right, so here's a quote from this story where he talks about, Eastwood talks about libertarianism. He says, uh, they thought Obama seemed like a nice guy, but they're registered as libertarians. He says, I like the philosophies. The Libertarian Party is nothing, and they don't have any candidates. But I do believe if we just leave everybody alone, quit trying to think of ways to run everybody else's life, maybe we'd be better off. It may be impractical, it may be obsolete, that kind of thinking, but it's just kind of the way I was raised. Maybe it'd be better off. Yeah, if he had... Well... It's pretty good, though, you know? It's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. He's being I'm a, big a little bit... This. No, yeah. No, he's definitely he's being a little bit modest there. Um, but, yeah, it's a good quote. I like it. Sounds like something I would have said, probably. Good man. Yeah, seems like a decent dude. This uh, article was in February 2009. So this is back 
could have been some Ron Paul uh, influence here. I don't think he mentions him, but interesting. Yeah, well, if he was raised that way, and he's just always kind of been that way, it's interesting that he's, you know, this late in life that he's identifying as different, I suppose. But if he's always kind of been that way, he didn't really have a name for it. That's another thing. And good on him. Yeah, well, it seems like uh, the names of the political ideas are shifting sands. You know, like liberalism used to mean laissez-faire, and now, of course, means like progressive uh, interventions in every aspect of anyone's life, policing thoughts and sayings or speech, um, making everybody That's equal. Bedroom. Yeah. Which, of course, is impossible. I am taller than you, Robert. No amount of government intervention is going to change that short of cutting my legs off. You're impressing me. Oppression? That's yeah, what I don't understand. This, this call for equality, this egalitarianism. It is, there, nowhere in nature does equality exist. Like, there are always no, faster, smarter, dumber, slower, whatever, in every aspect of nature. Yeah, I, I, I think most people seem to think that, you know, um, there should be equality under the law. I mean, if you're going to make a law that does a thing, you should apply it universally, right? But, of course, it never happens. There's another strike against government. Um, yeah, just the idea that you're oppressed or there's inequality, therefore there's oppression. Because oppression is equal to power, and a power is just the ability to realize your desires and your wants. Oh. oh, I had a thought. Never mind. What was that noise? Are you there? Nope. Not there. I don't know if I'm still being recorded. So I'm going to start singing. Oh, God, no. Don't do it. Change, 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 man. Well, this is embarrassing, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, and we're back. Uh, Read Roth, our podcast. I don't know if we were getting a little too close to home for the LAPD. They may have cut off my internet uh, to try to stifle our voices, but I think we were talking about Clint Eastwood being a libertarian. Uh, I don't know uh, where else... Uh, we might have been, or what else we might have been saying. Do you have any recollection there, Robert? Oppression! Uh, no, I, I'm i glad I got cut off. I think I was in the middle of some kind of rambling rant and was kind of saved by the bell there. So, welcome back. Sorry about the little interruption. Sorry about the breakup in my ultra-smooth flow of delivery. But we actually have a guest to come on and discuss her thoughts and feelings about the movie, and it would be nice to get another perspective on this matter. Yeah, well, you know, it's going to take just another moment because uh, Child 1 just body slammed Child 2, or, yeah, Child 2 onto the hardwood floor, so she'll be with us in just a moment, but I think uh, we were talking about Clint Eastwood claiming uh, libertarian philosophies, and that's uh, always a a good thing. Another one that um, I'm a big fan of is Vince Vaughn, who is also a libertarian, so he's pretty fun to to, to watch in movies like Swingers and whatnot. That might actually be a good one to do at some point. Yeah, I don't know at what point he adopted his libertarian philosophy, but he's definitely definitely an ally at this point. I don't know all of what he believes. Um, I'm sure that when you get to that kind of a position, sometimes truly saying what you believe can alienate some of your fans. Um, I know it happened to Mel Gibson, regardless of what you think about what he said. Um, the fact that he actually did say what he believed, maybe he was drunkenly saying what he believed. It did alienate a lot of potential viewers of his work. Um, now, I, I think what we have to say is actually a much more popular message um, because it's, it's something that everybody can identify with. Um, you know, nobody advocates for a government to decide who you can love, who you can be friends with, who you can associate with, but a lot of people will advocate for a government that can decide what kind of light bulbs you can buy or what kind of toilet you can buy or, or how, how much big water pressure can can be. Yeah. Now, how big your shower head can be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But everybody can agree that uh, a government that would decide who you can and cannot love or care about um, for themselves at least, even though they will oftentimes say that governments should decide who it can and cannot marry, which is we find absolutely disgusting. But uh, even, I think even the most ardent racist would recoil if the government said, no, you can't marry that person that you do love. I, I have yet to meet anybody like that. So I think everybody can identify with some form of 
freedom, some sort of law they say, hey, leave people alone. So yeah, sad. whether they recognize it or not. Um, we were talking when we were in person about even minarchists and even devout, you know, progressive liberal types all have a, a certain threshold past which government will go too far. And so there's right. this uh, continuum, this scale that is essentially on in an individual basis. And so what's too much for one person might not be enough government for another person. And so essentially no one will ever be satisfied with the amount of government. And uh, a point you made to me in response to that was that government's function or legislators' function is to create additional rules and regulations and laws. So even if there's a snapshot, uh, you know, this is what government is right now at this particular moment and this is satisfying a certain number of people, it's going to change by tomorrow. It's going to change by next, you know, the next 10 minutes. Right. So even if you're perfectly satisfied with this version of government right now and you're the one person that loves it, you're not going to be happy <laughs> tomorrow or the, the next minute. So it's a system whereupon everybody is unhappy all the time. Nobody thinks we have a perfect system at any given time. So it's really a bizarre like mind trick that's been played on people that this is the best system, that this is a great thing, even though everybody's unhappy all the time. Yeah, whereas if I have a problem or a, something I need a solution for on the market, I can get that product or service and ostensibly solve whatever issue I was having, you know, assuming the product works correctly or I was correcting my assessment of what was needed to correct it. But at least there's an opportunity for me to be satisfied. Whereas with government, it's a fleeting moment where the amount of government uh, in play will satisfy a certain individual, and then that moment's gone. Yeah, never to be seen again. Oh. Yeah, government's constantly changing, and they're constantly adding new laws, new regulations. And even if, you know, your idea of form of government is in the future, it will come and go. So it's, it's a weird thing for people to be, so many people, because really you have two sides of the continuum coin. Like you've got either the minarchist side, which even from your most laissez-faire minarchist, Randian objectivist, to your most control freak, liberal, whatever, lefty, I want to control everybody. It's still just a number of rules and regulations, a number of functions that government ought to do, and you're just adding on a few more things or a lot more things in some cases, but you're either on the side of government has legitimate things it can do, and you just have a list of a varying size of your list, or you have a, a side of it where government has no legitimate function, and uh, that's the side I'm on, and it's the side where everybody has the opportunity to be pleased. <laughs> it's because you're a fucking white male and you're old <laughs> well that's why you shouldn't listen to me that's why everything I should say should be discounted everything I say is garbage sorry well hey we um, our MMA style fight between the two girls has ended and my wife is shaking her head no but she she gets to be our very first guest so uh, Robert I'm going to hand it off to her and she's going to give us her thoughts on changeling a little bit so feel free to uh, develop her thoughts a little bit, and then we will come back, you and me, and wrap up the show. How's that sound? I'll, I'll do what I can. No promises. All right, folks. The very first guest on the Reed Rothbard podcast, my wife, Jamie, talking about Changeling. Here you go, wife. Hello, Jamie. Hello, Robert. How are you? Hey, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Doing well. Yeah, we're over at the neighbor's house with the kids, which is always fun. Um, yeah, and I watched... Yeah, so Dan and I watched Changeling the other night, and the, I would say the most shocking thing to me was that the nine-year-old boy, it wasn't questioned that he was left at home alone. And then I was thinking about it, and of course it wasn't, because at the time, I'm sure that was common. Um, it wasn't seen as inappropriate. Now it's legal, and everyone would be saying you know, negative things about the parent, their neglectful, mm -hmm. and, and all those sorts of things. Um, and it's, it's illegal, but it's also now, I guess, it's just a social norm. That's not something that you would do. We have a, a friend in the neighborhood that has a nine-year-old, and he'll occasionally leave the kid alone to run to the store. I don't agree with it, but he's the parent. So, you know, right. we're not going to say anything, of course. Um, do you it, think it just that Jolie, Jolie's character in the movie was being negligent? I mean, I don't know. My kids are young, so for me, I think when they're like 30, maybe they can stay home alone. <laughs> but a nine-year-old seems a little young to me, just because I know that certain things can come up during the day. You know, what if a stranger comes knocking at the door? We have, you know, weird people in our neighborhood. Um, what if there's a fire? What if they try to cook something mm -hmm. for themselves? 
Um, right. Just different situations can arise. Sure. So the what, interaction so what, bet between Jolie and her son it would make me think he seemed like a responsible kid. It probably wasn't a big deal. It obviously wasn't the first time that he had been home alone. Uh, he looked really unhappy that he had been left. You know, he, he didn't get to go see his movie, and his mom left him to go to work. Right. But he seemed to rather, in the movie, I remember him being very indignant about needing any kind of a babysitter because she said, I'll have somebody come in and check on you. And he said, I don't need anybody to check on me. And she said, well, I'll just have them come and check on the house then. Something to that effect. That's true. Now that you mention that, I do remember that. So he seemed to be very independent and yeah. strong-willed and intelligent and very capable. So he felt he was. And that's obviously yeah. still Jolie's decision to ultimately make, right, as a parent. I missed all that. Oh, well, so even if your child feels like they're fully capable of taking care of themselves, it's still, at nine years old, I think it's your decision as a parent to ultimately be the decider on whether or not your child is actually capable, because there's still more things that you know about the world than the child does, regardless yeah. of how the child feels about it. I agree. Our one-and-a-half-year-old, her favorite phrase is, I do me. And right. what she's trying to tell us, she wants to do it. She wants to climb up in her seat. She wants to buckle the seat. She wants to get food off of the counter. She can't do those things. <laughs> right. Not safely, because she, she's not you know, aware of her abilities and gravity. So yeah, we help her. Exactly. And that's your position as parent to know about those things and to look yeah. up in the situation. Um, what about the rest of the movie? Um, so you felt that Jolie was perhaps negligent, perhaps not in that situation. But I'm, what about what about the, the condescending attitude of the police that telling her who her child was and that this child was her child? I mean, how would you feel as a mother? I mean, to have someone come along and say, you don't know what your kid looks like. That would be infuriating. I, Dan yeah. and I were talking about it um, last night, and he's like, no, you, you would lose your mind. You would go on a murdering spree. You can edit that out. But, you know, <laughs> I, I'm surprised she was as composed as she is. And part of it is, you know, it's a movie. But right. she also probably knew in the back of her mind that the repercussions for, you know, speaking out against the police or making a big fuss about it. So I'm sure that, you know, made her keep her calm a little bit. And just the role of women in general at that time, it, I didn't live at that time. So I, I can't speak to it, you know, fully. Right. But, but it, I, from seems my like it, wasn't, it seems like it wasn't appropriate for women to um, you know, voice themselves fully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I kept wanting her to get, be as insulting right back at them as they were to her. Because them saying that this was her child and she just didn't know what her child looked like is yeah, the like ultimate been insult. Yeah, it is the ultimate months. insult against any parent. Are you kidding me? I don't know what a child, my own child looked like. How stupid do you think I am? I think she should have been just as insulting right back at them. But like you said, she is dealing with people that are willing to throw her away and lock and imprison her or even less of, the least lesser of offense of just being difficult to deal with and not accepting the, their uh, judgment. Yeah. Did you have any other um, points that really stuck out at you, you think, about this movie? Um, well, I wrote some notes, but then the little one tore them up, so. We've touched <laughs> on two of the three. Uh -huh. So you mentioned when we saw you the other day, you didn't see this as being a, a feminist or feminism as a theme in the movie. Did, did well, I thought it was more of a, well, I could see it from one angle that it would be a feminist. If you saw the movie through a feminist lens, I think you could. Well, feminist, the other thing through a feminist lens. Systemic, uh, systemic oppression of women. Um, but I thought more of as a, as a violent group treating a weaker group with violence because they could. Like they were bullies, being bullies because they could bully. Yeah. Um, I could see that. What did you think of uh, the feminist message, but that like she still required like men to come to her rescue? Um, I didn't think about that. How dare they? <laughs> um, you know, I don't. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. 
Because this movie, this movie really triggered my kind of white knight impulses. I really wanted to reach into there. I wanted to be in that room, and I wanted to defend her. I wanted to save her out of that sanitarium. I wanted to beat up every one of those nurses and every one of those doctors and just rescue all those people in my superhero mind. And that's because you saw that they were doing something wrong. It's, and you're a good person. <laughs> okay. But because it is a woman, you know, feminist groups are going to see it, identify it, identify with it because she's a woman and see it as, you know, everything yeah. wrong with how society treats women. Right. Even though they were doing bad things to everyone and even right. touched on that in the movie. Yeah, they went around and killed men who just happened to be competing with them. Yeah. 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 Well, so um, what do you think of, I I guess, uh, in the end, she never gives up on her child, and I don't think any parent really would. They never gave up hope that he was still out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is probably good. Uh, A horrifying thing for any parent to have to deal with. Yeah. It's it's a scary movie to watch as a parent, and then you start you know you start to think about how you would handle it and how upset you would be, how it would change your life, and it's it's scary. Yeah, um, I was kind of disappointed that she never really enlisted anybody but this corrupt police department to find her child. I mean, and clearly she's not you know like a rich person, but she had these this priest guy and this pro bono yeah. lawyer guy. You think she maybe could have enlisted somebody else to help help find her child? Although she did have the media a bit, you know, a fair amount of news coverage. But yeah, still, I'm, somebody else to help find it would have been good. I'm not sure what other resources would be available, but, you know, even after the the court case and stuff, do you think that she would still feel comfortable going and, I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that. Never mind. That's all right. That's all right. Um... Any more thoughts before we wrap this up? This is a pretty long episode. No, that's okay. Um, no, no other thoughts. Okay. Well, thanks for being on the show. <laughs> I'll give you back to Dan. Okay. And now you can see why I married her. Our very first guest, my wife, Jamie, talking about Changeling. It was an honor and a privilege to have her on the show. It was fantastic. Good to get another perspective on things instead of just two old white men. Yeah, yeah, get, a, get an old white woman. <laughs> Actually, she, she's a lot younger than me, <laughs> and she's within earshot, so I shouldn't have said that. Anyway, uh, let's start to wrap this one up. I think that it's about time. We've already had uh, one uh, internet cut uh, denial of service attack by unknown sources. Might be Russia. Uh, Probably. Might not be. I don't know. We have credible evidence leading towards it was uh, their MO and their uh, preferred methods of doing things. I, I'm, of course, giving you a bunch of bullshit. Doesn't matter. We don't need evidence. <laughs> So uh, anyway, we have been the Reed Rothbard Podcast. Just a little bit of housekeeping today. Today, uh, December 30th, is the last day of the uh, Tom Woods Liberty Classroom special pricing. It ends at midnight tonight. I don't know if it's Eastern or Pacific. So uh, we're going to be posting this show in a couple hours, and then you'll have a few hours left to take advantage of that. You're going to save over 150 smackers off the uh, master level membership. We're going to kick in a annual membership to read it for .me. Uh, and you can find all the details out down at uh, reedrothbard.com slash libertyclassroom. Check it out. And uh, Robert, thanks for joining us. Yeah, buddy. Hey, my pleasure. Awesome. Yeah. Um, we, we did what we could. Uh, this is a fairly straightforward movie. A lot of bad people doing bad things. But uh, there's some interesting context surrounding the events. Um, and uh, it's good to hear about Clint Eastwood. Good on him. Hopefully he makes some more movies. Maybe some libertarian-minded ones. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah, he's getting up there in the years, and, and uh, so was uh, Thomas Sowell, uh, and he's, he's great on um, discrimination and uh, basic economics, minimum wages, things like that, and I think it was him or Walter Williams who uh, said that uh, a lot of the things he was saying at the time or writing would be considered inflammatory by many folks and uh, racist, uh, and of course, in the only whites can be racist kind of way, uh, and, and then they would discover that he's actually a black man. <laughs> So I think that's always kind of cool. You, uh, and apparently today, black people cannot be racist. Right, yeah, and, and, and that's a topic for another day. I think, I think we've got another special lined up, or in, in the thinking, in the thought process of doing one, and it'll be the most controversial episode of all time for the Read Podcast. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thanks again, and uh, appreciate all you folks out there listening. We wish you a happy New Year. We're going to do a New Year special. Probably record that tomorrow. We'll have another special guest who thought he was going to be our first special guest after our uh, first actual special guest fell through, but then my wife usurped him. So there you go. That's that's how it works in the market economy, ever shifting. Right. We we threatened to have your wife on the podcast for a long time now, so I'm glad we finally got it done. Yep. Yep. Good job. Good job, everyone. All right, well, uh, thanks again, and I will talk to you all later. Good night, folks. Love you all. The Chipmunks. C-H-I-P-M-U-N-K. We're the chipmunks. Guaranteed to brighten your day. Do, 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 do